that I need to start with is to disabuse you of some common uh, uh, roaming around theories about, uh, about this uh, role of Arabic science. And uh, the very first of them uh, is a uh, theory that says the greatness of Arabic Islamic civilization is that it preserved the Greek sciences so that they could be translated into Latin later on, and hence Europe could re recover its, uh, its classical antiquity and we'll all be happy and everything is okay. Uh, just at, uh, at the very uh, top of uh, the, the topic, uh, I don't know of any other civilization that simply worked to service another civilization. Usually, the people uh, do things for their own needs. And their own needs uh, need to be uh, uh, discussed, they need to be studied. Somebody has to figure out why did they bother to pick up. I will select the evidence with many purposes in mind because I don't have much time to do it. I only can capture you for about one hour and I will be able to tell you what I want to tell you within that space. And hence, I will use every slide and every evidence that I will use for that specific purpose to answer many questions. One of them will be to demolish this myth that, uh, that the Arabic civilization was trying to preserve the Greek tradition. The second myth that we all know about, and I think you read it in every textbook that uh, speaks about the history of Europe in particular, uh, says that Europe had a little bit of a Renaissance recovery in the 12th and 13th century because there were many translations of material that came from Arabic into Latin, and from there on it ended about the 13th century, and the Renaissance from there on was a European enterprise on its own. That's a myth, and I will show you some evidence also that this whole activity of translation uh, need to be rethought about, we need to rethink it, and to re-examine what was being translated, why, and when did it end, if it ended, and so on. So I will also select some evidence to, uh, to demolish this myth as well. The third myth that I would like to uh, uh, to subject to some critical uh, argument, evidential argument, I should say, is the myth that says that the European Renaissance was an attempt to recapture a Greco-Latin antiquity. It may be true, very much true for the humanists, meaning those who were reading Homer and who were reading Cicero, they may indeed be attempting to recapture Greco-Latin antiquity because reading Homer yesterday is just as beautiful as reading Homer a week from now or a month from now, and similarly Cicero. But for scientists, we all know that science is an enterprise that gets obsolete very quickly. And I challenge any scientist here in the audience to tell me how seriously they would read a book on science written in 1920, let alone picking up a book that was written a thousand years ago. So in a sense, we will, be, we will not be paying enough respect for the minds of the scientists of the Renaissance if we think that they were going back a thousand years to pick up their science. And what I would argue today is that they did exactly what any modern scientist would do. They were not any less scientific in their brains than our modern scientists are, and they looked for the latest in science, and I will show you that the latest in science was not to be found in the ancient Greek obsolete text, but it was to be found in the Islamic civilization, and I will show you exactly which ideas were picked up, how they were incorporated, how they were used, and so on. So finally, at the end, I hope that I will be able to show you that, that the integral relationship between Renaissance uh, science and the Islamic science is such an, is such an organic relationship that it's very difficult to dismantle one of them from the other and continue to, uh, to, be, to be legal. Uh, the nature of the evidence that I will uh, subject you to, and I would like to speak only from evidence, by the way, uh, uh, the nature of the evidence is in various categories. The very first is very simple. Well, uh, it's uh, uh, evidence of direct transmissions. We know the original Arabic, we know the Latin translations, but then, again, I will select that evidence because I want to defend one of those other theses that I spoke about at the very beginning, so we will hit that many birds with that very same uh, stone. Second, then, I will also subject you to a evidence that is less obvious in its transmission, but I am willing to bet my last dollar that it came from the Arabic tradition, and I will also show you why I am willing to bet, to bet on these things, and uh, hopefully I think I can win a single bet on this one. The third one, I want to address particularly the, the father of European science during the Renaissance, and this is in a, in a field that I know a little bit about, particularly the field of astronomy, and I want to show you what kind of mathematics 
uh, somebody like Copernicus was relying on in order to construct his own mathematical models for predictive purposes. And here at the very beginning, I should also say, especially for those who will summarize this lecture in some fashion or other and turn it into the press. There is not a single Muslim scientist that I know of who defended the idea of heliocentrism. Take that out, okay? He, Copernicus' project was to borrow the mathematics that was developed in the Islamic civilization to straighten the models, to make the predictive models work, and at the very end, hold the sun fixed and get everything to run around it. But the rest of the model, this is a simple mathematical problem. Mathematicians know exactly how to construct a mathematical model with respect to a fixed point. So all he did, he changed the fixed point. There is a great debate as to why he did that. I don't have time to do that because it will take about two semesters to discuss particularly why that shift did not make sense at that time. And it was not the clumsiness of the church that they don't like science and all that nonsense, because there was real scientific reasons why that shift actually should have been debated and was debated indeed at that time. But as far as the Islamic mathematics is concerned, it was mainly written in Arabic, that's why I will use the terms Arabic and Islamic interchangeably almost, and as far as they were concerned, as far as the cosmology that they were working from was still an Aristotelian cosmology that was centered on the earth. But there they were trying to solve some very serious problems to make that cosmology consistent with the mathematics that would describe that cosmology. In other words, their problem was a scientific problem. I, I need mathematics to describe a physical phenomena, but I don't want the mathematics to demolish the physical phenomena that it will describe. I'll give you an example. If I, if I assume that the world is made of a sphere, I cannot represent it by a mathematical triangle on the board. That would destroy the sphere that is my original assumption. So they, would, they were working on this level of making the mathematics and the physical nature that we are talking about to make it consistent. And that is the attractive part that became the, uh, the fulcrum of what the Renaissance scientists uh, found attractive. At the very end, as I, as I said, I will show you that this organic relationship cannot be easily uh, demolished. Starting with that, what I call this concrete, uh, straightforward evidence, you have right in front of you here an Arabic text written on algebra in the 9th century by a man called Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi. And just as a side, by the way, this is the same al-Khawarizmi whose last name gave us the term algorithm. So for those of us who think that we need to look at Arabic uh, science just to entertain those poor Arabs and poor Islamic civilizations who feel defeated nowadays, just to make them feel a little bit uh, happy about themselves. Uh, I, will, I, I remind you, every time you use the word algorithm, you should be thankful to Mr. Khawarizmi, after all. And this is part and parcel of our Western civilization now. We use these terms. Every single computer scientist here uses these terms. Every mathematician uses them. But the reason I chose this particular slide not only to show you that it gave us the term algorithm, it also gave us the book that he wrote, and the title of the book that he tells us, he doesn't write it at the very top, he was very modest. Modesty is a virtue. Believe me, it is a virtue. So what he does at the very beginning, he thanks God for keeping him alive, he thanks his patrons and all of that, and at the very end he says, very humbly, he says, I wanted to write a book on Hisab al-Jabr wal muqabala the Jabr is what gave us, and this is the translation, and notice the Latin translation picks it up from the end of the page, puts it up at the very top, and it's in here, Liber Muhammad de al Jabra. And they transliterated the Arabic word into Latin because there was no Greek word for algebra. There is no Latin word for algebra either. So what you 